Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Mindgasms podcast. Uh, Tim's back today, aka Chief Keefe, and we're going to do another delusional episode. We're going to talk about Deleuze's thoughts on Alfred North Whitehead, the uh, famous philosopher known for developing process philosophy, along with other things, I'm sure. And that's based on another one of the essays from the book called Deleuze's Philosophical Lineage. So, uh, Tim, do you want to start off, as you always do, with uh, an introduction into Alfred North Whitehead, and then we can talk about Deleuze's thoughts on his opinions? And here we go. All right. <laughs> All right. So Whitehead, um, <clears throat> interesting philosopher in the 20th century, not very well known except those of us nerds who really have have um, studied the history of philosophy closely. I first became aware of him many years ago when I was taking my first philosophy class because he was in my textbook for my very first philosophy class. And um, I actually had the textbook with me. So there was a little section in there about process philosophy, which is what Whitehead is well known for. But he did mm -hmm. not start off as a philosopher. He, in fact, started off as a mathematician. <clears throat> so a little bit about his background. He was born in 1861. <clears throat> this is late Victorian England, and he died at the age of 86 in 1947, shortly after World War II ended. So as I said, he was known as a mathematician. <clears throat> That's what he specialized in. And he, early in his career, is known for collaborating with Bertrand Russell on the Principia Mathematica. Oh, I'm sure that's what he's probably very well known for. Yes, the mathematical logic. So the Principia Mathematica was um, a very important work in mathematical logic. Um, <clears throat> when did that come out? Sometime around 1913-ish, 1912, 1913-ish, yeah. <clears throat> okay. So this is early 20th century. This is also pre-war. And... Um, Russell himself is known for being a mathematician, but also as one of the founders of what then became known as analytical philosophy in England. Russell and then G.E. Moore. And that's um, one of the major, major two schools of philosophy now, along with uh, continental philosophy, right? That's right. But analytic is, it's a hodgepodge term. No. Okay. It, it's, I'm sure there would be some philosophers today that'd be hard-pressed that they would describe themselves as analytic, but... Be that as it may, Russell was one of the founders of post-Hegelian, anti-Hegelian um, analytical philosophy in England. Okay. So, okay. as I said, Whitehead started off as a mathematician. Then he moved from mathematics to philosophy of science, and he was very much interested in the developments coming out of um, the new physics, particularly Einstein. And then later on in his career, starting around... <clears throat> Like in his late 60s, when he retired from the University of London and he moved to Cambridge, Massachusetts to take up a position at Harvard University when he got into metaphysics and philosophy. Okay. <clears throat> so he, he developed a comprehensive metaphys metaphysical system which radically departed from most of Western philosophy, arguing that reality consists of processes rather than material objects and that processes are best defined by the relations with other processes. That's um, rejecting- this, Sorry to interrupt. Uh, this, is, this is reminding me of uh, maybe like an argument that William James would make. Is that why I seem to remember him being mentioned in what I've read by or about pragmatists? That's right. Well, Whitehead, okay. was, Whitehead was influenced by James, by the way. Oh, okay. Yeah. So okay. you can see where the, the influence is there. Okay. <clears throat> So, um, yeah, processes best defined by their relations with other processes and then thus rejecting the theory that reality is fundamentally constructed by bits of matter that exist independently of one another. Very much a Newtonian approach. <clears throat> and his best known work is entitled Process and Reality, which is the foundational text of what then became known as, even in this day, as process philosophy, which in itself has gone through many revisions ever since ever since uh, Whitehead's day. Okay? Okay. Particularly in, um, you know, process philosophy has really found its application in, um, 
environmental ethics, ecological civilization, and process theology, a definition of God defining as a pro defined as a process that coexists with the world instead of the traditional metaphysical approach that God is a transcendent object. My mom actually wrote a paper on that when she was um, an undergraduate um, in seminary. Mm -hmm. So she's, she probably knows process philosophy well. Yeah. Okay. So she might have a particular interest in this one when we get to yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll go ahead and skip Whitehead's early mathematical career and get to the philosophy. So we're going to go ahead and look at the Wikipedia because Whitehead is not easy. I mean, which philosopher, philosopher is really, but we want to try to get to the, the meat of this before we get to Deleuze. Now, I was <clears throat> listening to some lectures early on today of um, some theologians and other philosophers describing Whitehead and really getting a grounding in this. And I think I see where the, the crossover is with Deleuze, which we'll get to in a few minutes. <clears throat> okay, so philosophy and metaphysics. Now, at the time that Whitehead started writing about this in the 1920s about metaphysics, there, with, with the analytical movement, there already was a, um, a loss of interest in metaphysics, again, particularly Russell and Whitehead and the Cambridge uh, philosophers, because there was a turn to sort of aping national science, but also in the linguistic turn. Now, Wittgenstein was already starting to make his mark earlier on in Cambridge. And um, then, things, then things took a linguistic turn, and this ramped up after the end of the war. <clears throat> okay. I think uh, we were talking about that in the, in the few episodes that we've done with Hayden so far about Richard Rorty, weren't we? The linguistic turn. Yeah, yeah, the linguistic turn. That that was more the 50s and the 60s. That's a post-war period. Right. But Whitehead really started to take interest in metaphysics around the 1920s. Right. Now, remember, Whitehead died in 1947. <clears throat> and by that time, he was already in his late 80s. So he came from a different time period, the late 19th century. And this is where a lot of the um, the important scientific developments were happening, particularly Darwin, you know. A great explosion at this time, so he was there to witness that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so about metaphysics itself, uh, Whitehead says, quote, every scientific man in order to preserve his reputation has to say he dislikes metaphysics. What he means is he dislikes having his metaphysics criticized. Okay. In Whitehead's view, scientists and philosophers make metaphysical assumptions about how the universe works all the time. But such assumptions are not easily seen precisely because they remain unexamined and unquestioned. Key point. While Whitehead acknowledged that philosophers can never hope finally to formulate these metaphysical first principles, he argued that people need to continually reimagine their basic assumptions about how the universe works if philosophy and science are to make any real progress, even that, if that progress remains permanently asymptotic, meaning it is approaching a certain end, but it will never make it. <clears throat> okay. So for this reason, Whitehead regarded metaphysical investigations as essential to both good science and good philosophy. Okay. Okay. So he saw a need for metaphysics. Metaphysics is already there because it undergirds whatever the scientific assumption is. Philosophical assumptions too. There's always some kind of a metaphysics at work in whatever a philosopher has to say. Yeah, and that's and that to, that perspective really goes against um, like a more rationalist approach, or particularly like a more logical positivist approach, or especially mm -hmm. like a, a scientismist approach, or whatever you would call that. Right. What the logical empiricists were trying to do is they were actively trying to do away with metaphysics because metaphysical statements cannot be scientifically proved. Right. They couldn't be empirically verifiable. Okay. All right, continuing. <clears throat> Perhaps foremost among what Whitehead considered faulty metaphysical assumptions was the Cartesian idea that reality is fundamentally constructed of bits of matter that exist totally independently of one another, which he rejected in favor of an event-based or process ontology theory of being, 
in which events are primary and are fundamentally interrelated and dependent on one another. Okay. So instead of there being physical things, these things are actually processes. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it would make sense because if you take a rock, for example, the rock did not appear fully formed. Mm -hmm. However many millions of years ago it was created. Not yep. to mention if you pick up a rock, say, from the beach, and you set it down on another surface, you have already changed the rock. Maybe a microscopic part of it has broken off. You change the weight in some reason. Okay. Mm -hmm. So even though the object looks stationary and unchanging, it is actually a process. It might be an extremely slow process that is taking place, mm -hmm. but there is a process. Yeah. So again, Whitehead is asserting that it's event-based or processes instead of things. Yeah, it okay. reminds me of uh, evolution, which you mentioned. And then also, of course, we're always changing our environment as we interact it, as we interact with it, and it's always changing us as well. Right, right. So this goes back to the earlier point, is that where there are processes that are interrelated and they're acting upon one another. Yeah. Okay. So continuing, he also argued that the most basic elements of reality can all be regarded as experiential. Indeed, that everything is constituted by his experience. He used the term experience very broadly, so that even inanimate processes, such as electron collisions, are said to manifest some degree of experience. In this, he went against Descartes' separation of two different kinds of real existence, either exclusively material or else exclusively mental the mind-body distinction. Whitehead referred to his metaphysical system as philosophy of organism. That's his original term. But it would become more and more widely as process philosophy. Okay? Okay. Why did, he, why did he call it the philosophy of organism at first? I believe because an organism is um, it's a living system. Okay. Okay. So, you know, human beings are organisms. And what is a human being except a collection of organs, a collection of processes, physical processes, and maybe not so physical processes, always changing? Right. You know, you okay. start off as you start off as a baby, you grow into a child, into an adult, and so on. Okay. okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Let's see. Moving through here. Okay. So his conception of reality. <clears throat> Whitehead was convinced that the scientific notion of matter was misleading as a way of describing the ultimate nature of things. In his 1925 book, Science in the Modern World, he wrote that, quote, there persists a fixed scientific cosmology, which presupposes the ultimate fact of an irreducible brute matter or material spread through space in a flux of configurations. In itself, such a material is senseless, valueless, purposeless. It just does what it does do, following a fixed routine imposed by external relations which do not spring from the nature of this being. In this assumption that I call scientific materialism, also it is an assumption which I shall challenge as being entirely unsuited to the scientific situation at which we have now arrived. Okay. In Whitehead's view, there are a number of problems with this notion of irreducible brute matter. First, it obscures and minimizes the importance of change. By thinking of any material thing, like a rock or a person, as being fundamentally the same thing throughout time, with any changes to it being secondary to its nature, scientific materialism hides the fact that nothing ever stays the same. For Whitehead, change is fundamental and escapable. He emphasizes that all things flow. Now, where have we seen the, where have we seen this phrase before? All things flow. Mm, I don't remember exactly. Heraclitus. Heraclitus. Oh, okay. okay. Things are in flux. Okay. okay. Yeah. In Whitehead's view, then concepts concepts such as quality, matter, and form are problematic. These classical concepts fail to adequately account for change and overlook the active and experiential nature of the most basic elements of the world. They are useful abstractions, but are not the world's basic building blocks. Let me say that again. 
They are useful abstractions, but are not the world's basic building blocks. What is ordinarily conceived of as a single person, for instance, is philosophically described as a continuum of overlapping events. After all, people change all the time, if only because they have aged by another second and had some further experience. These occasions of experience are logically distinct, but are progressively connected in what Whitehead calls a society of events. Uh, By assuming really. that enduring objects are the most real and fundamental things in the universe, materialists have mistaken the abstract for the concrete. And Whitehead calls this the fallacy of misplaced concreteness. That's a good name for it. Mm -hmm. Okay. To put it another way, a thing or a person is often seen as having a defining essence or a core identity that is unchanging and describes what the thing or person really is. In this way of thinking, things and people are seen as fundamentally the same through time, with any changes being qualitative and secondary to their core identity. For example, Mark's hair has turned gray as he has gotten older, but he is still the same person. But in Whitehead's cosmology, the only fundamentally existent things are discrete occasions of experience that overlap one another in time and space, and jointly make up the enduring person or thing. On the other hand, what ordinary thinking often regards as the essence of a thing or the identity core of a person is an abstract generalization of what is regarded as that person or things most important or salient features across time. Identities do not define people. People define identities. Everything changes from moment to moment. And to think of anything as having an enduring essence misses the fact that all things flow, though it is often a useful way of speaking. So you can see why Deleuze is taking an interest in Whitehead. Yeah. I, I also like particularly that line, um, identities do not define people, people define identities. Yes, that's right. Okay, continuing. Whitehead pointed to the limitations of language as one of the main culprits in maintaining a materialistic way of thinking and acknowledged that, the w that it may be difficult to ever full, wholly move past such ideas in everyday speech. After all, each movement of each person's life can hardly be given a different proper name. And it is easy and convenient to think of people and objects as remaining fundamentally the same things, rather than constantly keeping in mind that each thing is a different thing from what it was a moment ago. Yet the limitations of everyday living and everyday speech should not prevent people from realizing that material substances or essences are a convenient generalized description of a continuum of particular concrete processes. No one questions that a 10-year-old person is quite different by the time he or she turns 30 years old, and in many ways is not the same person at all. Whitehead points out that it is not philosophically or ontologically sound to think that a person is the same from one second to the next. For sure. Okay, so then continuing. A second problem with materialism is that it obscures the importance of relations. It sees every object as distinct and discrete from all other objects. Each object is simply an inert clump of matter that is only externally related to other things. The idea of matter as primary makes people think of objects as being fundamentally separate in time and space and not necessarily related to anything. But in Whitehead's view, relations take a primary role, perhaps even more important than the relata themselves. Relata meaning the things that are related. Okay. A student taking notes in one of Whitehead's fall 1924 classes wrote that, quote, reality applies to connections and only relatively to the things connected. A is real for B and B is real for A, but they are not absolutely real independent of each other. In fact, Whitehead describes any entity as in some sense, nothing more and nothing less than the sum of its relations to other entities. Difference. It's difference. It's synthesis of and reaction to the world around it. A real thing is just that which forces the rest of the universe to in some way to conform to it. That is to say, if theoretically a thing made strictly no difference to any other entity, that is, it was not related to any other entity, it cannot be said to really exist. Relations are not secondary to what a thing is. They are what the thing is. For sure. Okay. So then continuing, <clears throat> I'll just go ahead and finish out the rest of this section. It must be emphasized, however, that an entity is not merely a sum of its relations. 
but also a valuation of them and reaction to them. For Whitehead, creativity is the, as the absolute principle of existence. And every entity, whether it is a human being, a tree, or an electron, has some degree of novelty in how it responds to other entities and is not fully determined by causal or mechanistic laws. Of course, most entities do not have consciousness. As a human being's actions cannot always be predicted, the same can be said of where a tree's roots will grow or how an electron will move, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, or whether it will rain tomorrow. However, inability to predict an electron's movement, for instance, is not due to faulty understanding or inadequate technology. Rather, the fundamental creativity freedom of all entities means that there will always remain phenomena that are unpredictable. The other side of creativity freedom as the absolute principle is that every entity is constrained by the social structure of existence, that is its relations. Each actual entity must conform to the settled conditions of the world around it. Freedom always exists within limits. Let me read this again. Freedom always exists within limits, but an entity's uniqueness and individuality arise from its own self-determination as to just how it will take account of the world and the limits that have been set for it, okay? So, when an entity is free to act within limits, but it is not determined how it will act, okay? Right. So then, in summary, Whitehead rejects the idea of separate and unchanging bits of matter as the most basic building blocks of reality, in favor of the idea of reality as interrelated events and process. He conceives of reality as composed of processes of dynamic becoming rather than static being, emphasizing that all physical things change and evolve, and that changeless essences, such as matter, are mere abstractions from the interrelated events that are the final real things that make up the world. Okay? Definitely. Makes sense so far? Yes, and I like how... Um he repeated that idea of becoming that we've gone over at least a few times as well. Yes. Okay. So one last section I will read on God because that's particularly interesting. Okay. So Whitehead's idea of God differs from traditional monotheistic notions. Perhaps his most famous and pointed criticism of the Christian conception of God is that, quote, the church gave unto God the attributes which belonged exclusively to Caesar. That's a reference to um, the New Testament, what Christ had said. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, render unto God what is God's. Right. Okay. Here Whitehead is, Christi is criticizing Christianity for defining God as primarily a divine king who imposes his will on the world and whose most important attribute is power. As opposed to the most widely accepted forms of Christianity, Whitehead emphasized an idea of God that he called the, quote, brief Galilean vision of humility. And here's a quote, quote, it does not emphasize the ruling Caesar or the ruthless moralist or the unmoved mover. That's an Aristotelian term. It dwells upon the tender elements in the world, which slowly and in quietness operates by love. And it finds purpose in the present immediacy of a kingdom, not of this world. Love neither rules, nor it is unmoved. Also, it is little, a little oblivious as to morals. It does not look to the future, for it finds its own reward in the immediate present. End quote. Okay? Making sense so far? Sort of? More sense than it looks from that. Yeah. So this is not a, yeah. the Christian conception of God. Yeah. Okay. It should be emphasized that for Whitehead, God is not necessarily tied to religion. Rather than springing primarily from religious faith, Whitehead saw God as necessary for his metaphysical system. His system required that an order exist among possibilities, an order that allowed for novelty in the world and provided an aim to all entities. Whitehead posited that these ordered potentials exist in what he called the primordial nature of God. However, Whitehead was also interested in religious experience. This led him to reflect more intensely on what he saw as the second nature of God, 
the consequent nature. Whitehead's conception of God as a dipolar entity has caused for fresh theological thinking. Dipolar meaning two poles okay. instead of unipolar. Okay. Okay. So the other important term is the consequent nature. Consequent meaning coming after, like a consequential in. Okay. Okay. So there's the primordial nature of God, which is the grounding of ordered potentials. There's the actual entities. We covered this before. And then there's the there's potential entities, which I think we might have missed. Okay. It's kind of like, a, you know, we, we discussed last time about potential energy and kinetic energy. You know, you take a ball, you throw it in the air, and as it's traveling and it's exhibiting kinetic energy, whereas if it's at rest, it has potential energy. That's physics right. 101. Okay. Right. Yeah. So the primordial nature of the ordered potentials from which actual entities spring. And God is the, pri this is the primordial nature of God is providing, for lack of a better term, the tissue of all these potentials that are in the world. Hmm. Okay. Okay. This also allows the novelty, creativity, because, you know, as we saw in the last couple paragraphs is that f Whitehead asserts freedom, but freedom is in within limits. Now, okay. in a way, that's a good thing because really there's no such thing as unbounded freedom. But within limits, whatever the entity is, is not bound to specific deterministic laws and how it will act. Okay. Hmm. So it's like if you're the, you, Andrew, within your house, okay. So you have the freedom to go anywhere you want within the house, staying within the house. That's the limits. Mm-hmm. But there's nothing that's determining you from getting a snack, taking a pee, going to sleep for a couple minutes, talking to me, shutting me off, talking me out bad again. There's nothing determining you from doing that. Hmm. Okay. okay. That's one way to think about it. That sounds a little bit like um, like compatibilism, maybe. How so? Um, maybe I'm maybe I'm getting maybe I'm confusing that with something else. But like the idea that you're not like it's not determinism you still have free will but there's still there's still some limits to what you do mm -hmm. like that's yeah. what that's what makes me think of it yeah i could run with that it's not pure determinism yeah right because in pure determinism there is no such thing as freedom right okay all right continuing on the primordial nature he described as the unlimited conceptual realization of the absolute wealth of potentiality. That is the unlimited possibility of the universe. Okay. Okay. So the universe has unlimited possibility. It could be one way, it could be another way, it could change, it could go back, it could move forward. Unlimited possibilities. It's not determined to be any one thing. Okay. This primordial nature is eternal and unchanging providing entities in the universe with possibilities for realization. It's the grounding of possibility. Whitehead also calls this primordial aspect the lure for feeling, the eternal urge of desire, pulling the entities in the universe toward as yet unrealized possibilities. This is the primordial nature of God. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, this is, um, I don't know, I'm the... I'm trying to I'm trying to think of like different ways of looking at God to compare this to. I don't know whether it's like maybe monism or something like that. No, I wouldn't call it monism no. because no. monism monism is uh, one substance. Yeah. Okay. It ent it entails an understanding of God as a substance, or it doesn't necessarily have to be God. It could be, you know, just something that is out there stuff instead of there being um different stuff many instances of stuff it's just one stuff so you could say you know what whitehead was, was was criticizing against is this conception of matter okay matter is somewhat monistically understood as the building blocks of the universe however matter does the understanding of matter doesn't account for anything else like potentiality or actuality or possibilities or freedom or things like that. 
Okay. okay. Remember situating Whitehead in, in the in where he was in the history of science and the history of philosophy. Okay. 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 Turn, yeah, turn of the 19th going into the 20th century. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay. This is making me think. This is making me think of how like how Kuf, um how Deleuze could um could use this to go into him talking about his plane of eminence a little bit. Oh, sure. The, this, in, in just reading through all this, all, everything that we've covered about Deleuze so far is just screaming out here. Yeah. Be because, like you said, with plane of eminence. So what is Whitehead describing about God? God is not a transcendental being. It's like a, a potentiality that like like exactly the way you were describing it you can you can choose to do these different varieties of possibilities and you can choose to do any of those but there's like there's a limit to them but there's there's all this potential that can right. that can extend further too right now god is not a potentiality god is the grounding of the potentiality okay okay unlimited possibilities in the universe but the key thing here is that this conception of God, first of all, is not a ruling God. That's what the whole thing about Caesar was. It's not a ruling God. It's also not a transcendental God. God is already within the world, within the universe. Yeah. Okay. It's like, this is, instead of transcendence, it's imminence. Right, right. Okay. okay. Make sense now? Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. Okay. So the primordial nature is the unlimited conceptual realization of the absolute wealth of potentiality, the grounding of the unlimited possibility of the universe that pulls entities towards as, un, as yet unrealized possibilities. That's the primordial nature. Now, God's consequent nature, on the other hand, is anything but unchanging. It is God's reception of the world's activity. As Whitehead puts it, quote, God saves the world as it passes into the immediacy of his own life. It is the judgment of a tenderness which loses nothing that can be saved. In other words, God saves and cherishes all experiences forever. And those experiences go on to change the way God interacts with the world. Okay, God is not separate from the world. It is interacting with it. In this way, God is really changed by what happens in the world and the wider universe, lending the actions of the finite creatures an eternal significance. So, God acts upon the world, and God is acted upon by the world. Hmm. Okay, it's so interesting. This is like, especially thinking about this um, in in relation to Deleuze's plane of eminence. This is like the most the most interesting perspective on God that I've ever heard described before. Yeah. So now you can talk. Once we finish Deleuze and we close out this episode, then you can have lots of interesting things to talk with about with your mom about. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Okay. Like, Mom, did you know that God is a plane of imminence, basically? That's right. I heard it from Whitehead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So Whitehead thus sees God and the world as fulfilling one another. He sees entities in the world as fluent and changing things that yearn for a permanence, which only God can provide by taking them into God's self, thereafter changing God and affecting the rest of the universe throughout time. On the other hand, he sees God as permanent, but as deficient in actuality and change. Alone, God is merely eternally unrealized possibilities, not a transcendent being, mind you, and requires the world to actualize them. God gives creatures permanence, while the creatures give God actuality and change. Okay? Yep. Yeah. Got that? Yep. Yeah. So that's God. And um, I think we'll just leave it at that. I don't want to go too far into religion. All right. Okay. So we've already provided the grounding of Whitehead. Metaphysics, cosmology, and his understanding of God. God is not a transcendental being. God is imminent within the world and the universe and is mutually relied upon. You know, this really figures in with his metaphysics about relations. God has a relation with finite creatures as finite creatures have with God. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with that out of the way, let's go ahead to the lineage book. This is essay number 15. 
Alfred North Whitehead by James Williams. Starts on page 282. Okay. All right. So I'll go ahead and read the first paragraph. <clears throat> James, or sorry, Williams says, there is no Deliz's Whitehead in the same way as there is Deliz's Hume or Deliz's Nietzsche. Okay, Deliz never wrote a monograph on Whitehead. He neither wrote a major book on Whitehead as he did for Spinoza or for Leibniz, nor did he refer to Whitehead's regula regularly to allow a critical or sympathetic position to emerge. This does not mean that there is no value or basis in reflecting on the Deleuze and Whitehead connection. So there's four reasons that James said, referring, returning to Link. Okay, the first one is biographical and historical. Deleuze has roots in an early French reader of Whitehead through the work of his teacher and colleague, Jean Wall, a fairly important philosopher in his own right. These roots then extend through Deleuze's teaching to thinkers who worked alongside him more closely on his philosophy and now trace a novel Deleuzean lineage. And um, within the past 10 years or so, Isabel Stingers, who is a French historian of science, wrote an important book on Whitehead, which I haven't read, but I have it, uh, really taking a different approach. Okay, so then the next paragraph, Probably the one book where Deleuze mentions Whitehead the most is what's called The Fold, Leibniz and the Baroque. It takes on a full and important role. Uh, the Fold is about Leibniz, but it's also about other things, such as Deleuze, or sorry, about Whitehead. I'm going to page 283, next page. Uh, William says, Whitehead is the catalyst for a rare moment of bile in lecture in Deleuze's lectures and writing, where he accuses a group of thinkers of having assassinated another philosopher. I shall not say yet who the perpetrators were, but the victim was Whitehead. According to Deleuze, his philosophical legacy was silenced for a period of over 50 years. Okay, referring back to what I had said before. So Whitehead and Russell were co-authors of the Principia Mathematica one of the seminal texts in mathematical logic in the early part of the 20th century. Russell became one of the fathers of analytic philosophy where Whitehead was going in his own direction with his metaphysics. After the war, Whitehead fell out of favor. Why? It's because of the dominance of the particular school of philosophy, analytical, logical empiricism. So it's not surprising that Whitehead, who is a metaphysician primarily, would have fell into disrepute because of what was happening with logical positivism and the birth of analytic philosophy. Okay. People just ignored it. And then it took, you know, as, um, as James mentions, about 50 years for it to come back around. So now when Whitehead is writing about this, this is in the late 60s, around this time. Okay, so then continuing. So Deleuze and Whitehead, both are deeply critical of an idea of explanation as the correct description to sets. For this is a blunt instrument destructive of the things it assigns and falsely supportive of the illusory sets it assigns to. Explanation is about connection and not boxes. Learning is about tracing new links and transformations rather than conforming stultifying grids. Sorry, confirming stultifying grids. Okay. Whitehead wrote an important work on the philosophy of education too, which we didn't cover here. But the point is explanation, particularly scientific explanation, is not about categorizing things, putting them in their little boxes. Rather, it should be about connection. But that's not how science traditionally defines um, its subject. You know, looking at things piecemeal. We had mentioned before about matter. This is the understanding. Matter is the fundamental building block of the universe. But it doesn't say anything about relations. Whitehead, yeah. on the other hand, turned it around and said it's about relations, not about things. And matter. I'm going to think about like this, this so much. Like how I hadn't thought before about like how it is like you're expla explaining, as Alfred North Whitehead says, that it's it's like a materialistic. He's criticizing like a materialistic conception of God, 
and how like it doesn't have to just be matter it can be like these potentialities and all the other things that you mentioned i never thought of like um like using that to define god in that way before because it seems like uh like counter to the way that i have defined god i which i guess was based based on like definitions that were given to me by uh, by militant atheists and by like people who live where I do, who have that standard, boring, stereotypical conception of God as like this man in the clouds influencing everything and that sort of thing. Right. That's the traditional understanding of God. And yeah. when you when you continue postulating God as the transcendent being that rules over the universe, you set it up for attack. Yeah. And that's why the atheists have been able, you know, the militant atheists have been able to take it down so successfully. It's because you're you're putting this this transcendent being that doesn't answer to anything that's in the the imminent physical material world. Not to mention the fact is that a lot of the militant atheists are scientists. Yes. Or scientisms. Scientismists. Yes. Scientismists, yes. Yeah. Just like, you know, Dawkins is and Sam Harris is and so on. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Now you go back to Whitehead, who was writing about this back in the started to write about this back in the twenties, completely ignored. And even in some survey courses in philosophy, you don't even cover Whitehead. No, I first became aware of him many years ago because he was in my textbook. I talk about process philosophy. Right. I never really read process and reality from cover to cover, but you know, looking at these things, it's like. Okay, yeah, I, I can get behind that, where if you get into the advanced physics, you're talking about things not as a solid object, but as a rather relations of um, uh, things on an atomic level or molecules or things like that. And they're moving all the time. The only reason, according to advanced physics, why you're looking at a rock and a rock appears to, to, um, to exhibit solidity is that the movement of the molecules is extremely slow. For sure. Yeah. Now the thing about God, you know, just to correct something that you said, this is not the metaph this is not the materialistic approach to God. Remember, God is more of a we'll say principle, for lack of a better term. The ground of allowing potentialities. Now, potentialities are particularly important for a whitehead. Remember, not things, but their actual entities, processes. It's all, <clears throat> it's all about process, not about things. Right. Okay. So, yes, that is a novel way of understanding God. And this is one of those where you can sit with it and then sit with it for a few days and then just like, well, oh, man, I really like that. It's at the ground of potentiality. Okay. Yep. Sorry. I forgot. I still had myself muted. Okay. All right. So page 284, the section, what is an event? Okay. So an event is important for both Deleuze and Whitehead. Okay. Uh, let me see. So we go to the fold, <clears throat> yes, the fold, the book in question. <clears throat> and to try to answer the question, what is an event? James continues, but Deleuze is responding to a quite different question, or rather to a problem as detailed as his novel definition of the term. A problem is a complicated series of relations between questions crossing over with one another yet resisting organization into rank or order of importance. The questions included in such problems are twofold expressions of affect or bodily and emotional transformation and intellect or consistency seeking yet also creative thought. This dual aspect means that a problem is determined not only by its questions, but also by its underlying tensions between ideas, affects and desires and their expression in actual states, both historical and contemporary. Okay. 
So could, you remind, could you remind me what the definition of affect is? Uh, affect is, it, it's a psychological term. Only I know that. Yeah, so it's, uh, let's see, expressions of affect. When you are affected upon, something is, is working on you. Oh, or okay. that you have, you have an emotional response to something. You might have a high affect or a low affect. Oh, OK. OK. okay. That, that's basically what an affect is. OK. All right. So going to the next page, uh, what is it, page 285. <clears throat> OK. The problem is the coming together of the following questions. And there's a list here. I'll go through each one of them. Number one, if events occur in infinitely connected series, which themselves subdivide infinitely, does this not commit you to a grounding chaos resisting all sense and order? Question two, if there are manifold events, how do these relate to one another without allowing us to break them into final components and thereby contradicting their infinite divisibility and interconnections? Question three, how are different series of events distinguished from one another if there is not a single chain of events? Question four, if there are novel events, or if there is novelty in each event, under what conditions can this take place and what is this novelty like? Question five, how can we distinguish between positive or good events and negative and evil ones if all a series of events are connected and if there is no external measure to judge them by? Question six, does this philosophy of events commit you to becoming without being or to process without permanence? If it does not, where is the permanence in your structures? Question seven, if there are different series of events, are these related or are they radically different? If they are related, why can't they be reduced to one series? If they are not related, can they ever be said to be in touch in any way or to belong to the same universe? Okay, so these are the seven questions asked of Deleuze about events. Right. Now, if we go to the next page, page 286, the first answer to the first question derives from what Deleuze derives from Whitehead is that events do not emerge from a pure chaos. Even if we assume that all is event, and even if we assume that divisibility and divergence are inherent properties of events, okay, events do not emerge from a pure chaos. That's the, the key term here, the key, the key idea. So this is because the idea of a pure chaos is a false abstraction from a necessary condition whereby chaos only appears when accompanied by a sieve introducing differential properties. These properties allow for a positive definition of chaos, not then as a mystical limit, but rather as the reverse of the condition. Differential, important Deleuzean term we know, differential processes appear against the background of a chaos constituted of all the other potential conditions. But the chaos only appears when taken with given differential processes. Make sense? Mm hmm Okay. Yeah, more, more mention of difference, of course. Right, so let me unpack this mm -hmm. just a bit. So when, we're when we talk about chaos, a conventional understanding is that there is no order in chaos. Mm-hmm. That's not the case, really. As a, and as a matter of fact, chaos theorists over the past couple of decades have asserted that even though on the surface it looks like there is no order to chaos, there is an order to chaos. Right. Right. Okay. So again, this is because the idea of a pure chaos is a false abstraction from a necessary condition whereby chaos only appears when accompanied by a sieve introducing differential properties. Okay. So the way I would read to that is what I just mentioned about the chaos theorists. No such thing as a pure chaos. It is an abstraction. There is a positive definition of chaos, which is that there is an order underlying the chaos too. Differential okay. processes against the chaos. Okay. okay. So continuing on same page. So how could it like, how could be, or how could chaos actually be chaotic then? Like if it were different? 
Well, let's go back to something we had seen before in an earlier essay. And I believe this is from What is Philosophy? So Deleuze and Guattari define chaos as the speeding up of the conditions. Do you remember this? Yes. Okay. So when there's order, things have slowed down, sort of. You know, we're, we're trying to run with this image. I don't have the exact quotes here. So when there's order, there's a slowing down. But when there's chaos, there's a speeding up. Right. Okay. So order seems to go out the window, at least a conventional understanding of order. Not to say that there isn't some kind of an order that underlies the chaos. Right. Okay. Okay. Makes sense? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So continuing on the same page. Connections take the form of vibrations or patterns extending along series. And these patterns have intrinsic properties that allow them to be distinguished from one another. So though we have no legitimate independent elements, we have legitimate differences between the patterns. These are the conditions for any subsequent abstraction into elements. They are also the way to unpick and criticize this abstraction. <clears throat> so Deleuze is criticizing abstraction just as Whitehead had criticized abstraction. Right. The fallacy of misplaced concreteness. Right. Remember that term. Okay. Right. Okay. So next page, 287. <clears throat> So introducing three of Whitehead's concepts, which we didn't cover in the last one. Uh, concrescence, which is a growing together. Prehension, which is a grasping. And a nexus, which is a... Um, so a nexus is a, is, a, is a crisscross of connections, in other words. They're all meeting together in one spot. Okay? I think you might have heard the term nexus before in other yeah. contexts. Yeah. Okay. So James says, an individual is a concrescence of prehensions. That is a coming together of ways a thing includes another thing in a normal process, in a novel process, in the way the bacteria take hold of the human body or the way a doctor takes hold of the molecular structure of the bacteria. <clears throat> On the one hand, the event is extended without limit. But on the other, it is made actual and determinant according to the ways things prehend one another. This prehension is itself dual because the prehension is public. Since it is available to be taken as that prehension and many other prehensions in the way bacteria might thrive on the original one or in the way a branch of medicine might develop around a particular discovery. But it is also private in the way the prehending thing feels it to be novel, my struggle with infection, for example. Events are therefore extended patterns and sets of individual concrescences, or nexes, which themselves have public and private sides. Again, this is all a definition about what an event is and Deleuze's uh, characterization. Okay. Okay. It's yeah. a little bit hard to follow because of these terms. Concrescence, a growing together, prehension, a grasping like prehensile, which is an adjective you just described, like a monkey's tail, something that is an appendage that evolved to grasp because you see monkeys swinging from their tails. Oh, okay. Okay, that's where prehensile comes in. But Whitehead is repurposing this for prehension. And at least the way I understand it is like the grasping, much in the same way as the tail. And the nexus is the coming together in one point. Okay. Okay, so again, events are therefore extended patterns and sets of individual concrescences or nexes, which themselves have public and private sides. Okay, okay. so continuing. Like uh, public meaning sort of interaction with your envi environment and private meaning like in your thought, in your head? Yeah, private could be internal. Okay. Okay. Okay, so next paragraph. Novelty, therefore, becomes the principle determining individuals. We saw this with Whitehead and creativity. There is an individual where there is a new take on given prehensions. Novelty is also the explanation for changes in patterns running through events. They change because individuals emerge 
when things are taken differently. Finally, novelty becomes the principle determining better or worse selections. It is better to increase the potential for novelty than to decrease it because it is the source of greater enjoyment and lesser evil in the relations of individuals and society. Deleuze then goes on to discuss the problem of permanence through the role played by eternal objects in Whitehead's philosophy. The parallel is drawn between these objects and their potential to be taken up in novel, actual occurrences, similar to the way we recombine words in novel ideas or poems. Now, just a quick note about eternal objects, which we didn't mention with the Wikipedia article, is an example of an, empiric, or, sorry, of an eternal object, a form or a shape of something. Okay. Okay. So if there are no things, but there are actual events, then an eternal object is something that is, you know, redness. So an apple could be red, a fire engine could be red, a book could be red, or so on. And this is not a quality. This is an eternal object, an example of one. Okay. Okay. This is where the permanence comes in, even okay. though with Whitehead's philosophy is process. Okay. Okay. The object has no existence independent of these actual occurrences, or to lose, use Deleuzian terms, independent of actual expressions of virtual potentials. Now there's that word virtual again. The reverse is also true. The actual occurrence is partial unless it is viewed with the eternal objects it brings into play anew. Then, towards the end, this leads to the distinction drawn between an imminent God as process and a transcendent one as selector of the best of all possible worlds. Ah, okay. okay. Now, where have we seen the selector of the best possible worlds before? I don't remember. Who's the one that combined the, the, the phrase, the best of all possible worlds? I Quiz don't time. Who? I, Leibniz. Oh, okay. 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 So mm -hmm. there's the distinction. With Whitehead, the definition of God is imminent. You know, I hammered home that point earlier. Mm -hmm. An imminent God is process, sort of the tissue or the stitching together of all the potentials within the universe. And that transcendent God as a selector of the best of all possible worlds. Mm -hmm. Okay for which Leibniz was savagely pilloried by Voltaire in Candide. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. right, yeah, we went over that in the Leibniz episode. Right, okay. All right, the Leibniz Whitehead Lectures. So this is not from the fold. This was a series of lectures that um, Deleuze gave as a lecturer. We won't go into the contents of those here. Hmm... Okay, skipping around a bit. Okay, so page 291. This is the section Stengers, meaning Isabel Stengers, on Whitehead and Deleuze. Okay, towards the bottom. The actual occasion is always a novelty beyond its conditions, to the point where these cannot be traced within it as that which it derives from. A novel creation brings such a degree of novelty to the processes it flows from that the relations are changed to the point where it does not make sense to say that the initial relations are components of the latter novelty. Though a series of ideas in past actual occasions leads into a new one and can be described as such, the novelty can never be accounted for in terms of its sources. Thus, if we take the example of historical events, a change in history cannot be explained fully in terms of its causes or in terms of the conditions that gave rise to it. But instead, we also have to find the novelty that goes beyond causes and conditions and changes them retrospectively. So this mention about historical events, I think, is very important because we look at the historical record and it's a series of events. Napoleon met his defeat at Waterloo. Before then, Napoleon had invaded Russia. Two atomic bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. Okay. Many 
possibly many millions of historical events, only a fraction of which have been recorded down. Okay. So for sure. And they were written by like, for most of history, people who actually were able to read and write, which was like the wealthy elite. Right. Those are illiterate. Yeah. Okay. So any kind of a change in history, you can't explain it fully in terms of its causes. So if we're looking at, say, counterfactuals, counterfactual history, which is if Hitler didn't shoot himself in the bunker, how would have World War II turned out? Yeah. Type I actually thing. wrote, or actually I'm still writing a multi-part blog series on that uh, that basic idea, basically. Um, it was about this operation called Operation Downfall. That was a full-scale invasion and um, and sort of espionage um, plan that was in place for if Japan had not surrendered after the bombs were dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Mm -hmm. So this was an allied plan or an Axis plan? It was an allied plan. It Operation included... Um, it included dropping at least seven more nuclear bombs and a full-scale invasion that would have dwarfed D-Day. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. All right. Yeah, so a change in history cannot be explained fully in terms of its causes or in terms of the conditions that gave rise to it. So this asserts novelty. And novelty is important within Whitehead, creativity, and then within Deleuze. Because you, you know, again, we just saw earlier is that you want to increase the conditions of novelty. Something new will arise from a configuration. Okay. So next page, page 293. We're going back to God again. So uh, again, this is Stengers on Whitehead. So God becomes process without human projections without divine providence and judgment, and without mystical or interpretable, interpretable parallels between originator and creation. Let me, re let me read this again. God becomes process without human projections, without divine providence and judgment, and without mystical or interpretable parallels between originator and creation. Were we then to object that this merely goes to show that the concept of God is redundant, the answer would come back that the concept of God is necessary to connect novelty in any actual occasion to the eternal objects it springs forth with, without reducing one to the other, yet giving well-determined principles for explaining their reciprocal relations. The concept of God explains why there is novelty and why it is valuable because it is the goal of the reciprocal relations of eternal objects and perishing actual occasions. Okay, so we already touched on this before. What is God? The primordial nature of God and the secondary nature of God. The primordial nature of God is to provide the grounding of the, of the potentialities right. for them to actualize. Okay, right. so when you look at this, you're thinking, Okay, so if God is not the transcendent object according to the traditional religions, what good is it? Why are we dealing with this? But God is necessary to connect novelty in any occasion to the eternal object that springs forth with. It is the source of novelty and the white Whiteheadian understanding. Right. Okay. So then right. continuing at the bottom of the page, Deleuze and Whitehead rely on a difference drawn between the numerical distinction of events which allows for probabilistic calculation relating them, and their formal distinction, which by separating radically in terms of calculation, makes each one the affirmation of the whole of chance, or in Deleuze's terms, one event, capital E, expressed by all events. It is because an event is incomparable and in that it affirms that special form of chance in every event. Right. Okay. So we're all still trying to define event here. Mm, okay, so then the next section. For a time to come, page 294, but skipping to page 295. He continues. <clears throat> 
According to Deleuze's philosophy of time, every event takes place in a parado paradox-driven dialectics between an eternal time in touch with the past and the future, or sorry, between an eternal time in touch with the past and the future, and an actual one. Okay, let me read this again. According to Deleuze's philosophy of time, every event takes place in a paradox-driven dialectics between an eternal time in touch with the past and the future and an actual one. Such a dialectics will not have a preset logic allowing for predictions or inferences. Hence its, in, hence its dependence on paradox is generating attempts at resolutions, but also undoing any such attempts thereby calling for a continual renewal of our thinking about the relation between two forms of time. I get the paradox aspect, but what, is, what exactly is meant by um, the distinguishment between the eternal and the actual? Okay, so you understand what, what dialectics means here? Yeah. Okay, so, you know, the Hegelian conception, thesis, th thesis, antithesis, synthesis. The thesis right. and antithesis are broken down. They are um, subsumed into the, uh, the synthesis, which then becomes a new synthesis. Or one way you could look at dialectics is kind of like a push-pull, oh, an apparating back. Yes, going back and forth, back and forth, relating to one another, and then achieving a resolution to carrying forward. So that's like a broad, generalistic approach of what dialectic is. Right. Okay. So the eternal time in touch with the past and the future. Okay. So this under the way I read this is the understanding of time stretches back into the infinite past. It stretches into the infinite future. Okay. Right. Time is a continuum, more or less. That's what the eternal time is. The events that have happened in the past, many centuries ago, none of us were around at the time. We read about them in history books, or you know, some of these some of these events in our own lives, if you've lived long enough, are many years ago, and they they um, recede back into eternal time. You're in touch with that past, and then looking towards the future and eternal time. Kind of makes sense. Yeah. Okay. And then the actual one: what is existing now? Then existing now. Then existing now. Then existing now. This is the actual time. Okay. Now has already become the past. The future right. has yet to happen. The future becomes the now. The now becomes the past. But the now right. is now. We're here now, now. <laughs> not, okay. not then now, but now, now. Okay. <laughs> it sounds like Dr. Seuss. That's right. Yeah. It's a Dr. <laughs> Seuss routine or a, or a comedy routine. Yeah. Yes. So such a dialectics will not have a preset logic allowing for predictions or inferences. Hence, its dependence on paradoxes generating attempts at resolutions, but also undoing any such attempts, thereby calling for a continual renewal of our thinking about the relation between two forms of time. So, thinking about time is not fixed. We must always be thinking about time anew. Okay? C. C. All right. So, next paragraph. There is therefore a view on the relation between philosophies and their historical epochs in Deleuze's work. But it is much closer to Nietzsche's concept of the untimely than to any sense of a philosophy as dependent on its historical epoch. Okay, that's an important point. So this also is what had motivated Deleuze's project from the get-go with his, with his idiosyncratic readings of philosophers. You take any one of his monographs and they do not read like the Rutledge Companion 2, fill in the blank, or the yeah. Oxford Companion 2, fill in the blank. Right. Okay. You look at a particular figure, you talk about he was born in this year, he was born in this country, he attended these schools, this was his first work, this was his reception of work, and with that commentary is the historical epoch. Hume mm -hmm. was a product of the Enlightenment. Kant was a product of the Enlightenment. Plato and Aristotle were products of ancient Greek. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is a philosophy dependent on the historical epoch. However, what Deleuze is 
getting towards is more Nietzsche's concept of the untimely, which is they seem to be philosophies or even philosophers appear to be at odds with their own time. Maybe if you, you could even say they were ahead of their time. You've heard this phrase before. Yeah. Of okay. Course. That's all what this thing about the concept of the untimely is. Okay. Okay. By setting itself at odds with its time, a philosophy grows against it and seeks to change it for a time to come. The key to the untimely lies in the open nature of the expression, a time to come, which neither allows for a firm logic for determining when that time will be, nor a well-determined representation for what that time will be like. Okay. <clears throat> so back to the probably ahead of its time for a time to come. The philosopher or the philosophy is untimely. It is looking forward to a time that has not yet come because we don't know when that's going to happen or what it will be like at the time. But we do know that looking at the philosophy, it is definitely set against its own time. It's untimely. Right. Okay. Right. For Deleuze and Guattari, philosophy, philosophies draw up their own planes of eminence and conceptual personae. And these are neither wedded to the times and places where they are formed, nor dependent on a close response from those times. Ideas, intensities, and singular turning points can remain latent for long periods of time. But this in no way implies a lack of potential or interest or novelty. This means that Deleuze's concern with the deliberate ignoring of Whitehead's work is not primarily about its snuffing out, since according to his philosophy, even a tepid dish served too late has a side in eternity and an ideal potential to be drawn out anew. Instead, rather than with the actual published works, the worry lies with the possible later effects that could have taken place but did not due to a form of academic repression. Deleuze's anger is caused by what a time what by sorry Deleuze's anger is caused by what a time lost because it was not allowed to create with Whitehead rather than how long it took for a later epoch to find Whitehead again this is why he was pissed off because in his estimation Guattari's too is that Whitehead really held really came up with some novel ideas at the time mm-hmm and one could only imagine that had it not had he not been derailed, you know, put off to the side or put out to pasture or whatever metaphor you like to use, what could have happened at the time or in the decades afterwards had he been given a had he been given a fair hearing instead of quote assassinated by later philosophies and then one had to rediscover him about fifty years later. Okay. And it's not just Whitehead. It could be other philosophers or philosophies, too. Right. Okay. So going back to um, the earlier point, is philosophies draw up their own planes of eminence and conceptual personae. Now, conceptual personae, we saw this some time ago It in um, What is Philosophy? So an example of a conceptual personae is the Cartesian cogito. Okay. It's a form of thought, and it takes on sort of a life of its own. When we talk about the cogito, philosophers, we understand what that means. Even though the cogito, as a concept, emerged in Descartes, we still see it later in the 20th century with certain like cognitive scientists or philosophers of mind. A Cartesian cogito, or you know, Daniel okay. Dennett comes to mind about the, the theater of representations in the yeah. mind. Yeah, for sure. Okay. That's another kind of an instance of a conceptual persona. Yeah. So these are neither wedded to the times and places where they are formed, nor dependent on a close response from those times. Okay. So there we go with, um, with Whitehead. Okay. Next page, 296. Uh, Deleuze is worried about the more general elimination of speculative metaphysics and its power to create new concepts, methods, and fields. Not in order to then impose a final one and to freeze all future creativity or to dominate an actual field, but rather in order to affirm a multiplicity of creative responses to events and ways of following on from them. Okay. 
So recall what we had said before about Whitehead and metaphysics. So Whitehead did not try to do away with metaphysics. In fact, he went into it wholeheartedly because scientists already are operating under a certain metaphysical conception. Ethicists are operating under certain metaphysical conceptions. So you can't do away with metaphysics altogether, regardless of what the logical empiricists tried to do. Sure. Now, with met now with speculative metaphysics, this is, you're not really trying to get at what the core of reality is. You are speculating. You are coming up with possible novel ways of looking at things. It doesn't mean that they actually exist. You know, new concepts, methods, and fields. It's just a way of shifting one's focus and shifting one's thought process to look at things in a different way. That's where speculative metaphysics comes in. And <clears throat> in certain corners of philosophy, speculative metaphysics now has a devoted following. Graham Harmon is somebody that comes to mind who has written on that. Interesting. Yep. Okay. So let's see. Okay, we will close out on page 296. If we are to counter the claim that Deleuze and Whitehead's metaphysical creativity turns away from more grounded and commonsensical truths and their capacity to align with demystification, then general claims about process philosophy or superior empiricism or transcendental metaphysics will do little to advance a case for the defense. In many, case, in many eyes, it will merely bring down a negative judgment all the quicker. However, if we use the vast resource of concepts, arguments, examples, and studies they both provide, and if we use these, use these rigorously and with precision to show contrasting yet related lines of argument and emerging useful and interesting ideas, none of which contribute to mystification, <clears throat> but on the contrary, serve multiple critical arguments, then the Deleuze and Whitehead connection will have worked on their own terms, not in the establishment of a school, but rather in prompting critical evaluations of what we take to be common sense, or a sensible matters of fact, or common ideas. Thereby, the metaphysical presuppositions behind such claims, and the different takes on reality lying in wait in different models and concepts, will always... <coughs> will also be shown at work. In turn, this will demonstrate the value of philosophical creativity as the careful construction of metaphysical systems in relation to culture, to contemporary lives, to history and to the sciences, to the exclusion of none of them. Okay. Okay. The end. Okay. Okay. So this one was a little bit, this one was a little quick tonight. Yeah, But I think what we can draw from this, I mean, for the essay in the lineage book, it was concentrating on what Deleuze had to say about the event in the fold, which he was clearly the most influenced by Whitehead. Now, it seemed like there wasn't a whole lot that, that Deleuze had to say about Whitehead, except that he was pissed off with the fact that Whitehead was just shoved to the side at some point. Yeah, But what we covered in the preliminary description of what Whitehead is, there's a lot that is Deleuzean in there. God yeah. is eminent. God is not transcendent. We speak about actual entities. We're speaking about differences, idea emerging from differences. Mm -hmm. So Deleuze certainly had a precursor in Whitehead, even though Deleuze never really paid all that much attention to Whitehead at the time. Right. Okay. And that's all I got. Questions or comments? Looks like we have no. a short one tonight. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think... Uh... I think that's uh that's good. I mean, it's I like this uh this idea like I said of um of of difference and bringing back the plane of imminence of course and uh and process philosophy mm -hmm. and uh and looking at god as imminent rather than transcendent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's all it's all uh very interesting. And yeah, I can I can totally see a lot of Alfred North Whitehead and Foucault now for sure. Yeah, and like I said, I'm really going to think about that, um, like speculative metaphysics and that percep perception of God is imminent because it's very, like I said, the very most interesting way I've, I've heard of describing God. 
Yeah, it's the, you know, I, I think I've spoken about this before. I really would like to do um, a series on Graham Oppie's books, O-P-P-Y. He is a, I think he's Australian, philosopher of religion. And um, he really gets into, I guess you could call it analytic theology, which is um, in part defining the concepts associated with, with theology or really getting into what's a conception of God. How, is God, how, is, how has God been understood in the history of Western philosophy? And he's also written books on the, the different proofs of God, such as the ontological argument, the cosmological argument, and so on. So this is all philosophical theology to, to really get down to the nitty gritty of what do we actually mean when we say God? Mm -hmm. What is it? Is it a transcendental entity as the conventional understanding has been for so long? Is it a white headed approach where God is not a transcendent being, but is more the ground of something? And now we, we, when you say it's the ground of something, maybe for lack of a better term, now that spills over into what Heidegger had to say about being. Now, was being a replacement for God? Quite yeah, possibly it was because, Heidegger, because yeah. Heidegger was, um, was originally educated in a Catholic seminary. Right. He originally wanted to become a priest or a theologian. <clears throat> right. Yeah. Okay. So now you see the connections here. Yeah. But really, you know, Whitehead, Whitehead is, is, is particularly interesting because now we see the, the overlap with possibly Heidegger and definitely Deleuze. As I said, lots of Deleuzean themes just scream at you from reading the, uh, the summary of what Whitehead is, even though the summaries don't do Whitehead justice, but we don't have time. We don't have time to go into process and reality. It's a thick book of about 400 pages and it can be quite confusing in spots. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Okay. Well, it's certainly interesting to, uh, to talk and think about though. Yes. Yeah. Now, also in particular where Whitehead really found a home or process philosophy has really found a home is in process theology. Right. Yeah. Ask your mom if she knows who Charles Hortzorn was. <clears throat> Charles Hortzorn. Okay. Hart, Hartzorn. Sorry. Hartzorn. Charles Hartzorn. Hartzorn. Okay. Yeah. American theologian. Very much in the process philosophy. Okay. She'll probably be tickled to death. Oh, you know about process philosophy now. All right. Great. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's close this out. All right. Uh, well, uh, so what's the, what are we going to do for the next delusional episode? Who's so there? we're going to be covering Raymond, Raymond Rouye or let's see. Either Raymond Rouye, who I think was a mathematician. Uh, no, that's not right. Philosopher of biology. Okay. Oh, okay. Possible. I think we'll go ahead and do him because right after Rouye is Heidegger. Oh, nice. Yes. So we want to... Um, That'll be exciting. Yes, we want to um, keep the suspense up for one more episode. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. And yeah, hopefully... Uh, Hopefully this Sunday we can do the next postmodern theology episode with Shane and Max Horn from Mixed Mental Arts. Yes. He's a big fan of philosophy. Uh, so, yeah. Thanks to everyone for watching another delusional episode of the Mindgasms podcast. Um, thanks to Tim for educating us about Alfred North Whitehead and Deleuze's thoughts on him. That's very interesting as always. And thanks to all of you who like this video, share it, subscribe to my channel, leave a comment on the video, and especially to those of you who contribute to me on Patreon. And I'll leave the link for my page in the description of this video, as I always do. And like I always say, I love you all. Keep being the tiny beam of light that shines through the almost impenetrable darkness in the universe. Most importantly, always remember this, the funk cures all. And then also for this episode, think about difference and the plane of eminence and process philosophy and how that can relate to God and metaphysics. And any last words there, Tim? It's just all a process. It's all a process, man. All right. Adios until next time, everyone. Have a good night. <laughs>